All you people that are getting married, why are we paying for the suit? You want to put me in the groom, bridal trade, whatever it's called, and I'm paying for my own suit. Why? And I'm telling you the suit I want, you're telling me we're not going for that suit. So I'm going to buy a suit I'm only going to wear once because of your wedding. Yeah, bastard. People would be saying, how can they support the channel? Chisel, buy chisel. I've got tops, got hoodies. I've got the Dragon Ball Z tees, like the Pain and Full Star tees. You lot can support, buy some of the merch. I'll be able to churn out more content. This one, I'm just waiting by myself for the, for the moment and I'll bring out more colors. Please support. Me. When you talk about, I was talking to someone the other day about um, teen pregnancies, yeah? And um, basically there was one girl who's got pregnant and basically the parents want to kick her out. So I, I, I asked this group of adults, I say, Look how old we are now. How many of our pregnancies were planned at this age? We talk about the 15, 16 year olds getting pregnant, yeah? As adults, how many of our pregnancies as adults now were planned? You that's 27, 28, 30, 40. There were 45 year olds still getting pregnant now and they didn't want to get pregnant. Yet we're going to diss the 15, 16 year olds for getting pregnant. We're no better as adults. You think about it, we diss the 78 year olds for getting pregnant, yet we're big old 30, 40 year olds having unprotected sex right now and we don't want to have kids with that person. <laughs> Yet we're going to diss the young ones. We're all, as I said, no one's perfect. We're all fragments of excrement. All of us are. Yet we diss the children so much. Yet as adults, we're still messing up. Even myself. When you look at all the things you promised yourself you wouldn't do, you still do it. Look how many times you self-sabotage. And most of the times when I'm talking, I'm self-reflecting. Because I said I'm far from perfect. I make a point of saying, I probably got more skeletons in my closet than anyone else. But I just manage myself. You know, I, I put myself well together. It looks good. You know, you paint a good picture. But, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not easy. And I've made a point of just trying my best to try and manage everything because we all go through our issues. And, you know, even with bullying, a lot of it molds, on, it molds and makes our character that we've got now. And it all starts from school. A lot of the people who are gangsters, bad boys now, you can see it from when they was eight, nine. And you've got to think about the environment they grew in from eight, nine. And I always say that a lot of the things that we go through is not a race issue, it's a class issue. They often say that the women from West London are, are of a better caliber than women from South London. I wonder why that is. Is it maybe because West London is more of an affluent area to certain parts of South? And don't get me wrong, there are rich parts of South London which are affluent and there are poorer parts of South London. But I think you get, you get my point or you get my drift. But it's sad that these young boys had to go through that. And I don't know, I don't know what even can be done with that. And I just feel sorry for the mum as well. It's just, it's a shame. It's a shame. But that's where you find that the schooling system has failed him. And God forbid this boy then de decides to turn into some tyrant now because of what's happened or because of the hands of somebody else. And there's nothing you can, it's almost like to say that they, they've technically done the right thing. But for me, I always say, if someone's bullying you or doing something, fight back. Even if it's, if it's, even if it's in the workplace, because people think bullying stops at school. <laughs> it's bullying in the workplace too and that's probably even worse in the workplace where someone starts and you know no one wants to talk to that person anymore because of this person and you're now on your break in the corner drinking your coffee by yourself while everyone's going on these work breaks and work lunches no one brings you in so this whole bullying thing doesn't just start from doesn't just stop at school it goes throughout your whole life and it's so important once again that you nip things from the bud when it happens you know even we're talking about domestic violence and I always say that it's very rare that a guy, and I, I use the men and women scenario because don't get me wrong, it happens on the other end. But I'm gonna use the men and women scenario. It's very rare that a guy just gonna punch you in the face straight away. She's usually gonna start with emotional abuse. Then he's gonna probably pinch you. Then he's probably gonna maybe slap you. That's when he's gonna start giving you the full on blows in the face. And you gotta nip it in the bud straight away. And the saddest thing about domestic violence, because I saw my mum go through it. And the maddest thing is that it's, most of it is to do with power and control. It's not even to do with anything else. And you gotta bear in mind that what a lot of these situations happen is that they ostracize you and pull you away from your family. So you've no longer got that support system. So therefore, when you are being physically abused, you can't even go back to them. And the worst part is that, especially when someone's parents have told you, oh, you know what, this guy's no good for you. And you're like, no, yeah, I love him, he's gonna work, he's gonna work, I love him, I love him. And you keep doing it. So now that the relationship's going bad, you almost feel that like you can't go back to your family and friends because they're gonna say, I told you so. And that's the baddest thing is that, even when people often say when someone's getting beaten up, or oh, why didn't you tell your dad or tell your brother? You know, I've met women and I've asked them that same question. They said that if I told my dad, it would kill him. And that's one thing people don't realize is that you got to think about it. It, it, Like some of like, some like I'm, as much as I'm calm, I'm a crazy man. You know, two of my sisters are married. No, three of them are married now. And I'm happy they could, they're probably watching this. If my sisters ran me and told me that they did something, I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. Like one of my mates, I'm not going to mention his name. One time he's, he's, um, his sister's husband, you know, um, 
she, he hit her. He hit her, yeah. Who went around there with a baseball bat? <laughs> and that's why sometimes sisters and women don't tell their family members because they know the consequence. Do, do they, does, that, does that woman really want to be the reason why that um, their dad or their brother's in jail? I've been in situations where I've gone to help where someone's been beaten up by their boyfriend or by being up by whatever, a guy or whatever, and the woman's gone back. And I remember one time, I think I was at 26, 27, and one girl I knew got beaten up by a boyfriend, so me and my mates went around there. You know what pissed me off the most about that situation is this. We got into beef with this guy for almost a year, and this girl went back to him. <laughs> I still ain't forgiving you, you know. You know who you are. We went to defend this woman. She then went back to her boyfriend. And don't get me wrong, there's trauma that makes you go back. Especially when you've been broken down emotionally that you think that you can never do better than that person. That, that woman that went back to her partner, we, I was in beef with this guy for almost a year because of this girl, this woman. And she went back to him. And even when she still went back, I was still beefing. I was like, brother, you're back, man. You got her back, man. Allow me, man. Like, <laughs> I ain't got a problem with you. She was like, you're beating up this chick, innit? And the beef squashed. Well, it's, I ain't seen him for a while, but I'm assuming it's squashed. Um, don't come to the restaurant to find me. Like, cheers, like. <laughs> but that's the thing about domestic violence. People don't realise is that why people stay. And it's often said that the most dangerous part of leaving a relationship is when you're trying to leave. So the most dangerous part of the relationship so is when you're trying to leave. And that's the reason why a lot of women stay and men stay. And a lot of the reason why men stay, obviously, is because I, I can't go and tell my boys that Brenda's punching me up. I'm not going to say that, yo, but Amanda, what's wrong with your eye, Gabriel? Yeah, like, Brenda, she must have banged man in the face too. It's just, it's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Like, you can't... Like, I, I can't tell the man them that. So sometimes when brothers are getting beaten up, you just stay in the house. They can't tell no one. You know, imagine you're watching Arsenal play Tottenham and she takes remote control and changes it to Real Housewives of Atlanta. That, that's domestic violence. I can't tell the boys. So now I'm in a WhatsApp group. They're saying, like, did you see the goal? I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, who scored? I don't know. I can't tell you because the, she changed the channel. Couldn't do anything. Mr. Tottenham Arsenal game, she changed the channel. <laughs> Jokes aside though, you can't, you can't, like, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough scenario, domestic violence, and I think it's important that, and I always say that, it's important that you teach these young boys and girls from the beginning that, you know, this isn't love, in it? And often we, we've romanticised all this dangerous stuff that happens and this trauma in relationships. We almost romantic we've, we've, we've romanticized it. You know, I, I stayed with him, I went through this, I went through thick and thing, I stepped on broken glass, I, I hanged on the, the, on, the, on, the, on the wing of the plane and I survived. Babes, like, you're romanticizing trauma and I don't understand why that happens. And it's with me and nip it in the bud. Probably one of the reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm where I am now. And people say, oh, you're not married. I've not fallen down and banged my head. I'm not married. I don't marry yet. My mum will go, oh, when are you going to marry her? When are you going to marry her? I'm like, who is Maria? Who is Maria? When are you going to marry her? Who is Maria, mom? I don't know Maria. And that's the reason, like, and don't get me wrong, I'm getting to the age, and it's hard when you get to my age, because everyone starts asking about marriage. This year alone, I think I've got 10 weddings to attend. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm going to start sending screenshots of DMs and make them up. I'm going to start photoshopping DMs to break up these relationships. I'm tired. I've got a wedding I've got to go to in Greece. Another week later, my mate's getting married. I've got a wedding I've got to go to in two weeks from now. I'm tired. Sunday just gone. I had to go and do wedding, wedding fitting, or whatever it's called, wedding shaping for, for my mate's wedding. And who's paying for the suit? I'm the one paying. All you people that are getting married, why are we paying for the suit? No, let's answer that question. Why are we paying for the suit? Let's talk about weddings now. I'm tired. All you lot are getting married. Why, are we, why am I the, You want to put me in the groom, bridal tray, whatever it's called, and I'm paying for my own suit. Why? And I'm telling you the suit I want, you're telling me we're not going for that suit. So I'm going to buy a suit I'm only going to wear once because of your wedding. You're a bastard. You're going to pay for the suit. I'm not paying anymore. You're going to pay. I'm attending, I'm, I'm part of three weddings this year. Three weddings. That's going to be three suits, four suits, whatever it's called, I've got to buy now of my own money. And then you want a gift as well. I'm not buying you a gift. I'm not buying you a gift. I'm going to your wedding. I'm paying for my suit. You don't want me to buy you a gift. I'm not buying you a gift. And to all you people, I've already mentioned it before. If I'm getting married, I'm putting tickets on Eventbrite. The tickets are going in there. You're going to buy your tickets. £35. Free course meal, unlimited drinks. £35. Because you're not going to come to my wedding, yeah, with your short hands and deep pockets and not buy me a gift. 
I went to a wedding the other day. I, I didn't see any gifts. There's probably about, there's maybe 500 people there. I probably saw about 20 gifts. Maybe they sent money, I don't know. But I didn't see gifts. You think they're going to come to my wedding? <laughs> you eat jollof rice, rice and peas, goat curry, chicken jerk. You'll have eba, ground rice, suya. And then you'll then not bring me any gifts. And then you're going to then complain that the jollof rice was overcooked. Yet you didn't bring any gifts. You then be drinking my Lauren Perrier and Verve Clico. And then you don't bring any gifts and complain and say the champagne ran out. It's your dad that's a fool. <laughs> it's your father that is a fool. It's, and I tell you what the problem is. Because your dad can't tell your mum about Sky News when the remote control is being taken. And the fact he's got a hole in his leggings. That's the reason why you're going to come to my wedding and not bring me a gift. You're bluffing. All you people that are doing weddings now, make sure that you put tickets on Eventbrite. Let them pay for their food and drink because most of the money that goes into the weddings, it's not the dress and the ring. No, 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 no. It's the catering and the hall where all the money goes. It's the party that you're putting on for everybody else. And there's nothing wrong. Celebrate your queen. Celebrate your wife. Please celebrate her. Even though it's going to be the same wife before that I do and after that I do, it's the same wife. <laughs> but please celebrate her. Do the big party for her. But just understand from my end, my own wedding, if I fall down and collapse and bang my head, my own wedding, you're going to pay for tickets. You'll be on Eventbrite. And remember, there'll be limited early birds. So the first set of tickets, maybe the first 100 will be at £35. Then it's £45 ahead. Then there's going to be the VIP section. The VIP section of the wedding is where they're going to be serving cocktails. And that's where the air is going to be. So if you want that section, it's £60 for tickets. That way, all of the catering and all the whole part of my wedding is paid for. And while we're talking about costs, let's now go to birthday meals. I'm tired of them. I'm tired of them. You'll set the time for 8 p.m. People start arriving at 8.20, 8.30, 8.50. And then you birthday person, you've told us to get there for 8. You don't arrive till 9. Now we're sitting there for one hour waiting for you. I'm done with birthday meals. You see me? Let me know the restaurant. I'll book a table for one by myself. So I can get there, eat my food. The rest of you can do your own palaver. When it comes to the bill, everybody wants to start doing Pythagoras theory. The amount of times I've been in a restaurant and we've had a table of 10.20, the bill comes and someone didn't pay for their chips, someone didn't pay for their rice, someone didn't pay for their cocktail, and the birthday person's having to pay for that person's food. You're evil. Especially ladies. You ladies will come to a birthday meal, 10, 15 of you. You'll order porn star, rum punch, Blu-ray, this one, that one, that one, strawberry dakairi, mojito, all of it. You will now come to the bill. Not only are you letting this birthday girl pay for her own food and drinks, this birthday girl is now covering the rest of the bill. You are wicked people. You think when me and my boys go out, we let the birthday guy pay for his stuff. I've seen it too. I don't, I don't, obviously, I don't know friendship groups. Maybe she's the bad friend in the group and you just said you would just come out for a night out. You don't really like her. But for me to go to a birthday meal and the birthday person's paying for their own food and drinks, it's disrespectful. I think it's disrespectful. But I'm done with birthday meals. Don't invite me anymore. If you're going to invite me to your birthday meal, let me have my own table of two in the corner. Me, I will have my own table of two, my imaginary friend. I'll buy my drink, I'll buy my food, I will go. This whole table of 15 and the bill comes and Margaret and, and, and Mark and Matthew don't know where they ate. I'm not interested. Drop me out. All of this group, group stuff. As much as, I, as much as I'm a team player, sometimes I want to be Ronaldo. I want to be Ronaldo. I'm not passing the ball. I'm not passing the ball. I'm not passing it. This whole 12 people and then someone doesn't know what they drank and then you want to split the bill evenly. So say, say I just had juice and I had mocktail. This person was doing champagne and doing mojito and dakari. So I should now, when my bill was 36 pounds, I should now cover this person's bill of 62 quid. So I'm now paying 30 pounds more because I didn't do that carry, no problem. I'll order Ace of Spades. If we're gonna go to town today, let's go to town. Let's do Ace of Spades, innit? So that way we can all share this bill. Because this idea that I will drink water and drink lemonade and I'm paying for someone's champagne, your father is a fool again. It's not gonna happen. That way, if we're gonna do champagne, if we're gonna do champagne and have a night out, let me go to town as well because People need to understand for birthday meals as well. Look at your friends' pockets. You know, sometimes I've gone to birthday meals in Mayfair and you fully well know that Derek can't do Mayfair. But Derek needs to know sometimes when to sit down. When you see Mayfair on the invite, stay at home. Maybe take him out to Nando's separately. And it's not a disrespect. If you're seeing Mayfair on the invite, why are you coming? You already know that water in Mayfair is 15 pounds for tap water. Why did you come to Mayfair? Because then, then, then the bill comes and we're splitting it evenly and you're now shaking the table like you've got Parkinson's. Bro, just say you can't come. And that's the thing about fear of missing out. There's some birthday meals that I've seen the name of the restaurant. I've looked at my bank balance, my Monzo. 
it's not for me this week. I'm not going. I told my brother, listen, you're going to this place. You're telling me that the, the tables is 200 pounds each. I don't have 200 pounds this week. Let's go to Nando. We can do Perry Chicken. I can do the 20 pound bill. I've still celebrated your birthday. But sometimes people don't want to miss out on something because they want to do Insta. They want to do picture and upgrade their Instagram account. Me, I don't mind. If my, if my pocket can't do something, I'm not going for the, for the bill to come and I'll start doing Shake Shake. That reminds me one time. One, reminds me one time a customer came and she had to, even her friends admitted it. She came to the restaurant. This is when I first opened. She ordered calamari. No, no, sorry, salt and pepper squid she ordered. She said, oh, um, she said, oh, she doesn't like it. So my staff said, oh, what's wrong with it? She goes, oh, um, it's not salty enough. So my staff said, oh, we'll get you some salt. She goes, no, 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 I just don't want it. So my staff said, oh, but if it's not salty enough, add some more salt. She said she didn't want it. No problem. So we offered her something else. We said, oh, um, would you like some salmon fish cakes? And she goes, no, oh, no, no, I'm fine. Um, let me just have my lobster. Because she's ordered that and lobster. So the lobster came over now. So the lobster's on the plate here yes, separately. Then you've got the, I think it was chips it came with. Then you've got the sauce, which is in, a, in like a pot. So remember, the lobster's by itself, the lobster tail. Then you've got the sauce in the pot, and you've got the chips. So this lady has now tasted the sauce that's meant to go with the lobster. She actually doesn't like the sauce, so therefore she doesn't want the lobster. So my staff has gone over to her and said, oh, um, what's the problem? She goes, oh, um, I don't like the sauce that goes with the lobster. So the, the, my staff said, oh, would you like another sauce? She goes, no, no, I just don't want it anymore. I don't like the sauce. So my staff said, the sauce is not on the lobster. So obviously you can see her friends, they start kind of like sinking in their seat, like, oh my God, oh my God. So obviously now, I don't like to get involved in it. So I've come over now, I'm like, hi, you know, and I always make a point of when it comes to science with customers. Whenever you're talking to a customer, if you're a member of staff, always try and bend down, so you're eye level. So it doesn't look like you're talking down on somebody. So I bent down, even though I've got bad knees. I bent down. I said, um, hi ladies, what's up? She goes, oh, um, da -da -da. You know, I'm not really enjoying my experience here. I ordered some salt and pepper squid. It wasn't salty enough. So you know what I mean? I'm a bit cheeky sometimes. I said, oh, um, if it's not salty enough, what would you, um, we offered you some salt. She goes, oh, no, but I shouldn't have to be making my salt and pepper squid more salty than I need it to be. So no problem, Brenda. Um, the lobster you said you wasn't happy with, what's the problem? She goes, oh, um, the sauce it comes with, I don't like the sauce. I said, you haven't touched the lobster. She goes, yeah, but I don't like the sauce that goes with it. I said, but you haven't touched the lobster. So I said to this lady that we're not taking this lobster off the bill, that the salt and pepper calamari or squid, whatever you've got, I'll take it off the bill. This lobster, you're not leaving this place. You're, you're gonna pay for this one. Come and see fracas. So her friends are like, oh my God, da, 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 da. So this girl and I went to the toilet. Then this is when they, they called me over. Oh, I'm really sorry, you know, um, we, you know we, she shouldn't really come out tonight. I don't know why she did come out, but you know, um, don't worry, we'll cover her bill, we'll pay for the lobster. And that's why I mentioned, sometimes you've got no one not to come out of your house. Stay at home. It's not every engagement that you've got to RSVP. There's certain, like, two of my friends now are in California. They're doing Gra Gra and Jaye. I, I can't go. I've, I've, I've blocked and restricted two of my friends. I can't see their stories. So for the next two weeks, I'm not going to see their posts. So don't think, lads, that I'm, not, I'm just not liking your pictures. I can't see your pictures anymore. You're not going to torment me while I'm in the UK and you're doing America and doing KOD and King of Diamonds. You're not going to torment me. I blocked you. That's why I don't miss out. So when you get back to the UK, I can now start seeing your posts. So what, what I've done is I've muted your posts and I've muted your stories. So I can't see anything now until you get back. So when you now land, then we can now be friends again. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm not going to pretend. I really wish I was. I wish I was there with you guys. I'm really hurting. You know, um, it looks really good over there. It must be nice. You know, but when your pocket can't afford certain things, you stay at home. And I know my pocket. You can't treat me out of my position. And, and even when it comes to talking about positions, I always have to talk about imposter syndrome, which is something which is very, it's something that's detrimental to a lot of people, which actually tricks them out of the position that they should be in, is when you don't think you're good enough to do something, when in reality, you are. A lot of people don't start businesses. A lot of people don't apply for that job role. So for instance, a lot of people who are in executive positions, it's not because they're any more smart than you. It's just that they believed in themselves. And the imposter syndrome will make you think that you're not in the right place to do something when you can. A lot of times um, I've opened businesses and people have said to me, what made you think you can do it? And I'll be honest, I didn't think I could. But I know that I'm pretty good at certain things and I'm pretty sure it will work. And so much times we're searching for perfection when it comes to business. And sometimes that perfection you're looking for is never going to be found which why it's important to, to somehow get rid of imposter syndrome. How do you do that? Very tricky thing. And the only thing I can advise is just to believe in yourself and to have people around you who believe in you too. Get rid of all the negative people. You know, sometimes you need someone that's gonna tell you no. So don't get me wrong, there are certain things that people will start. There was a lady who wanted to do a t-shirt business 
And um, I, when I broke the numbers down for her, she, she could see herself that it wasn't good to do it. So when someone's telling you no, is that no someone telling you you haven't got the capabilities because they're looking at themselves and thinking they can't do it? Or is that no because they've broken down the numbers and realised you can't? They're two different things. You know, me telling you not to open a restaurant in Mayfair because of rent and business rates is going to kill you. It's different from me telling you that, you that you shouldn't open a restaurant. I don't know if you get the two different things. I'm not telling you not to open a restaurant. I'm telling you that restaurant there is probably not a good idea because I've broken down the numbers. Sometimes people don't break that down to just telling you no. And that's because sometimes they're using their own abilities to judge your capabilities. And you have to be very mindful of that. That imposter syndrome can stop you from getting to the next position you are in. A lot of the jobs that you're not applying for, apply for them. What's the worst that, that you can be told is no? And that fear of rejection is something that holds a lot of people back. You shouldn't be scared. I take rejection all the time. It builds character. And it's one thing a lot of men are used to. How many times have you gone to chat up a girl and just told us no? Just move to her bedroom. It's, <laughs> you're not going to make me have imposter syndrome. I tried to move to Shelly. Shelly weren't having it. <laughs> hey, Brenda. How about you just spoke to my friend Shelly? Hey, Brenda. <laughs> What's going on? And that's why I don't suffer from imposter syndrome. You know, sometimes a girl will say to you, oh, you always use the same chat up lines. When I'm going for a job, do you not hand out the same CV? The same CV I'm giving to JD Sports, I'm giving to Foot Locker. In the same way, that same job that you need to apply for to increase your pay packet, just tweak your CV a bit and give it to somebody else. And you've got to remember that half of these people who are in better positions than you, they're not more intelligent than you. They just had the balls to go and apply for that job. And it's important that you try not to suffer from imposter syndrome because that's the thing that's holding so many people back thinking that they're not good enough and not adequate. And even when you take it outside of business, even when it comes to like men and women or men and men and women and women, sometimes you don't talk to this person or even times you're being spoken to. And I've heard of women, um, if you remember Take Me Out, there was times when um, women would turn their light off and Paddy would ask and say, why did you turn your light off? Oh, I didn't think you would like me. Brenda, you've turned your light off because you didn't think this guy would like you. You, just, you, you didn't want to wait and see. You could have been in Fernando sipping Perry Perry on your chicken and doing mojito. But because of imposter syndrome, you turned your light off. That's the same reason with a lot of things in life that there are positions and things we could go for, but we don't go for them because of imposter syndrome. We see that job that we can apply for, we don't go for it. We see that funding we could get, we don't go for it. There's even maybe some filming that, that um, Wes could go for. Maybe he's seen, I don't know, Blue Story might be doing some filming. Wes might think, oh, they're not going to book me. Just send, it, send a DM or send an email. The worst that can be said is no. There's nothing more that can be said apart from no. So many opportunities we can go for, so many things we can get. The only thing holding us back is imposter syndrome. Just the fact that you feel that, oh, I don't think I'm in a position to get it, man. I don't feel like the right person. There's never the right person for something. And when people say, oh, luck, 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 no. I don't believe in luck. I believe in being prepared when the opportunity presents itself. And that's one thing I've, I've prided myself in is just be prepared. Be prepared. For whatever opportunity might happen in life, be prepared. So when that opportunity does arise, it's you that gets it. Just be prepared. And I'm very last minute and I'm trying my best to stop being last minute because it's become so detrimental and it builds stress. Sometimes people say, oh, I work better last minute. You're so stressful, man. I'm so last minute. I'm the kind of person that will have something to do and, I, and I'll start working on it a night before. And then I'll start panicking. It gets done eventually, but it's not, it's not good for the brain. It's not good. But imposter syndrome is one of those things that, how do you heal it? I, I couldn't tell you. But one thing I do know is that you need to rate yourself. There's so many people that I talk to in business and they're so scared of taking risks. And I'm like, do you not know that you're the shit? Like, you're actually good at what you do. And there's, and there's nothing worse than seeing people in positions where you know they're talented, but they're just, they're just scared to take the next step. And you sit there thinking, only if I could. Like, imagine I could sing. You, don't, you, think, you think you could even have access to me if I could sing? Because you know I can dance already and act. Imagine I could sing. There's how much people I can see that can sing and it pisses me off. If I could sing, I'd never speak. I will sound like you Birmingham people. Yo rap, yo rap, oh one, two, one. Everything I would do would be a song. And that's why when I see people in positions, it really pains me when I see someone with so much skills and I say, why aren't you doing this? But same conversation we've had. You need to know what stress you can take. Sometimes people may not apply for that job, not because of imposter syndrome, it's because they don't want the stress that goes with it. And there's so many people, who, so many people I've seen who have been like CEOs and executives who have dropped down a level because they said the workload is too much. They'd rather earn 10K less than have all that stress that goes with it. So, you know, it's been a long conversation. You know, um, Chizzo's in um, a certain part of the country enjoying himself. So I um, had to step in and fill in. Um, I didn't want to. I'd rather his, his channel suffered, you know, because um, you can't be out there enjoying yourself and have your skivvies working for you, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't actually like this, Chiz. 
um, you need to come back and do your job. Thank you very much. But um, next episode is going to be an interesting one. We're going to do it with Ish. So we're going to do a day in the life of Ish, who's got um, a cash and carry up in Essex. So we're going to walk around with him and just see what he does. And he'll give you an insight into business. So um, yeah, look out for the next episode. If you like the episode, more to come. There's going to be some US versions. And yeah, stay tuned. See you soon.